Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse 21. So your Bibles should be open to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. I know this is a familiar passage, but this is a great passage that we'll be looking at today. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there was one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So you join me as we, we open a word of prayer and look into God's word. Lord, we thank you that you answer prayers. So that's why we bring these before you. We know that you're able to keep things moving. We see in the Old Testament where clothes lasted longer for people. That food went further. And the same thing can take place for us. We thank you, Lord, for answering the prayer requests that have gone up before you in regards to Cal and taking care of his situation and bringing him home. And still, Lord, we, we don't know all the details, but we thank you for hearing us. And we look forward to hopefully that he'll be here next week with us. There are others who are sick, Lord, and we lift them up before you. Ask that you would restore their health. We take it for granted that everything in our body works perfect and then until it doesn't. And we thank you just for today, for the good health that you've given to us. We ask, Lord, that you would help remove those things that would cloud our thinking that we might be able to focus on your word and pay attention and apply it to our lives. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't understand. How can I forgive him after he has done this to me? Or, how can they forgive me for what I've done? Do either of these statements sound familiar? Perhaps you've been on the receiving end of a tyrannical boss, or a cruel in-law, or a rebellious child. Maybe a neglectful parent, or an unfaithful spouse or you've been the object of sexual abuse. The very thought of this brings an onslaught of conflict, conflicting feelings. Memories are replayed in your mind, and you are left reliving the anger, the guilt, and the regret. In that moment, you are reliving the past. Without realizing it, you have built up walls of protection against the people that have wounded you and anyone else who reminds you of a, that similar situation. As time moves on, you are aware of the pain of the wounds does no longer consume every moment of your thought. Yet, the moment that wound is revisited, you are, in conscious, you are conscious of the sensitivity and the pain has not diminished with time at all. Is it truly possible for others to forgive me? 
Can these walls that have been built up in my life be removed? It's hard to imagine a life without the dull ache or the raging fire within. The Word of God speaks to the person who remembers the family member, the friend, the co-worker who has something against him. And the Word of God remembers the person who has sinned against these exact same people. The offense of sin has crippled the offender and the innocent party. There is one place to find healing for these wounds, and only one place. There is no forgiveness possible apart from the cross. Oswald Chambers wrote, It is, a, it is shallow nonsense to say that God forgives us because He is love. The love of God means Calvary, nothing less. The love of God is, is spelt on the cross and nowhere else. The only ground on which God can forgive me is the cross of my Lord, unquote. Sin must be removed before forgiveness can take place. Therefore, let us turn to God's word to discover the divine standard of forgiveness, followed by the act of forgiveness, and then finally, then we can apply the practice of forgiveness. So that's our outline for today. We're going to look at the divine standard of forgiveness. That's our foundational truth that we're going to stand upon as we approach for what forgiveness is, because it matters to us. And then we're going to see it practiced, meaning, well, we're going to see an act of it first. So we got the foundation. We're going to see how it looks. All right. And then I'm going to ask you to put it into practice. That's going to be the scary part. The word used in the New Testament that we translate as forgiveness is aphiomi. The meaning in the classical Greek was often used to send forth or send away. It was used to speak of a woman or about divorce. In the Gospels, aphiomi came to take on the meaning or the sense of forgiveness. In Matthew 6.14, Christ says, If you forgive other people their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So you get that word, aphiomi. God will forgive you if you forgive others, is that, that idea. We do not read much about forgiveness in the letters of the Apostle Paul. And you might say, is that because the Apostle Paul doesn't think forgiveness is important? Not, of all, not at all. In fact, the Apostle Paul takes the word and, the, and changes it into a concept and speaks of forgiveness in the doctrine of justification. It's the foundation in which God has removed the sin from the sinner without violating his righteous character. After all, sin cannot be covered up. It cannot be ignored. It cannot be forgotten. So let us turn to the book of, of Romans, Romans chapter 3, to, this, to see his divine standard, the divine standard of forgiveness. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. This is how we see this. This is how we get a chance to see how God deals with sin in order to provide forgiveness. We must get this. Every single one of us, we must be able to lock on and hold on to this because it answers the question, how can a righteous God forgive sin? How can God make me right before him? And I want you to notice, love is not the focus of the passage. Justice is the key thought that's found here. Follow along as we see how many times the word righteous is used, or justice. Righteous and justice, it's the same word that's used here. And glory. And I'll explain that in just a moment. You say, wait a minute, isn't glory a different word? Yes, it is. But in the context of, you'll see this in a moment, it's referring to righteous. So, in chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Now, but the righteousness of God. Ah, underline these. It's important for you to follow this stuff along. 
Then verse 22, even the righteousness of God. So you get this idea that the righteousness of God is important. And then you skip down to verse 23. He says, all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, what do you mean the glory of God? Does that mean God's, oh, no, it's referring to God's character. What is it that they're falling short of? The righteousness of God. That's his glory that's referred to in this passage. That's the standard that God is laying out. That everybody is not measuring up to. Verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. We get the same thing again. Verse 25. His righteousness. How does this take place? By his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. We move on to verse 26. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier. So God is righteous and he's the one who gets to declare who is just, who is right, and who is righteous. So throughout Romans chapter 3, 21 through 26, this whole idea is who is righteous? God is righteous and God is the one who can determine who is righteous and who isn't. This is extremely important. Because right off the bat, go back to verse 21, we see righteousness is revealed. It says, but now. Every time you see but, but now, a change has taken place. From chapters 1, 2, and this part of chapter 3, we've got this entire thing that the Apostle Paul is trying to persuade us. And basically this, everybody is a sinner. It doesn't matter what your position is, you are a sinner. We've used this high-class, mid-class, and low-class sinner type of thing. But it basically it doesn't matter what position you are, everybody is a sinner. Whether you think that you are an intellectual, you're a sinner. Whether you think you are a moralist, I just, I've got good morals, you're a sinner. Or you're a religious person, you're a sinner. And that's what Paul goes through the entire thing. You're a sinner because you do not have the righteousness of God. God is righteous, righteous alone. The righteousness of God is real, revealed apart from the law, apart from the prophets. Both the law and the prophets pointed to the righteousness of God. The character of God's righteousness is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So, righteousness is revealed. In verse 21 and 22, we see righteousness is received. So how do we get this? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. How do we get this? Through faith. If a person wants righteousness, they have to receive it through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to believe in God. It's not enough to believe in the Holy Spirit. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's available to all. There's no limit here. It's on all who believe. We also notice that righteousness is a requirement. It's required in 22 and 23. There's no difference between people. For all sinned, all fall short. When we say all sin, it means that all sinned in the past. More importantly, every one of us is sinful. If I heard stories about your, from your mom and dad, they would say, look how cute all of you were at one time or another as babies. And they would say, isn't he or isn't she a precious angel? Maybe a demon. Because one of the first words you learn, learn besides daddy, which is probably the greatest word that you could ever learn, show my bias, the word that you learned is no. No. And very quickly, if we want to be honest with ourselves, we saw that sin nature come out in the attitude of the child. And it's simply of, don't touch that, or stay away from that. No. Every one of us is sinful. And all of us have fallen short. We failed to reach the goal. As we examine our lives, we see that we do not measure up to the righteous standard of God. So, righteousness is a requirement. Verse 24 shows us that righteousness is realized. 
It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What do you mean it's realized? We are justified freely without any cost to ourselves by God's grace. Our justification is through the, the, the redemption act that is in Christ Jesus. Justification is not an act, is an, excuse me, justification is an act, not a process. That is important for us to grab and hold on to also. It happens and it's done. You are not in a process of being coming justified. It is a one-time moment. Christ imputes his righteousness to us. This does not make us righteous, but God now sees us as being righteous. It's like open up a ledger or your bank statement. You know that you are broke, but somehow magically the bank says you've got money in the account. And you call the bank and you say, wait a minute, I know I don't have any money, but the bank says, we're sorry. You have an unlimited amount. But I didn't put it in there. We said, well, the bank acknowledges that's true. You did not put that in there. But somebody put this amount in there. Well, who is it? We can't disclose that information to you. So it's for me to spend? Well, all we can tell you, sir or ma'am, is that you have an unlimited amount of money. So we see you as rich. Oh, by the way, we're going to treat you as rich now. So would you like to invest some of your money in our bank? What a change. That's what's taking place here. Christ imputes his righteousness to us. God sees the imputed righteousness of of Christ on us, and he then declares us as righteous. God credits, credits us with Christ's righteousness, and then says, you are righteous, and You have the standard of that, and he then begins to treat you as righteous. He doesn't treat you as if you you never sinned. So now God can forgive us or forgive me because something has changed. God has not changed. God has stayed the same. What's changed is you and me. We've changed. God hasn't. God's standard has stayed the same. God hasn't put his thumb on the scale and said, well, I'm going to give you a break because I love you more than the rest of people. No, my righteous standard has stayed the same and I've changed you so you can measure up. How is that possible? Well, you did believe in Christ. Christ came and died on the cross for you. You believe that. So now that I see you, I see you through Christ's death and resurrection. Wow. You've seen this acted out at least in the movies. Someone's going to this elusive nightclub, special people to get in. And you see a long line of people just can't wait to get in. And then someone seems to cut into the line. They talk to the bouncer and the bouncer says, oh, you're welcome to come on in. And they let the people pass. Like, well, how how come I don't rate? Ah, you don't have the same thing that these other people have. See, the difference here is you do get to go into the front, except you're not going into a nightclub, you're going into heaven. And the person who gives you the credit to get in there is Jesus Christ. So the bouncer, if you will, sees you and goes, oh, huh. you belong with Jesus Christ. And you go, yeah, come on in. And that's what God sees. So we see righteousness is realized, but righteousness is also resolved in verses 24 through 26. Jesus is stated here, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Jesus Christ is a propitiation, meaning he's the mercy seat. He's the place where God's wrath is satisfied because of the sin sacrifice that was made. Jesus Christ met the demands of the righteousness of God against sin by satisfying every requirement of God. Now, you know from the Bible that the wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin must be paid. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they had a plan. And their plan was sort of a simple plan. But it's not a plan that you and I would have come up with and thought on our own. The plan was that Christ would humble himself He would take on the form of a man. He would be the substitute for man. 
and be the sacrifice for man. And because God could not ignore the sin of man, God would not give you and I a pass, nor would he ignore our sin, nor would God give us a mulligan. God's righteousness must be satisfied. Now, God can look at everybody and declare everyone who has faith in Jesus as being righteous. Because Jesus goes to the cross, dies on the cross, and rises again from the dead. God not only declares us righteous, which is fantastic and wonderful, but he now treats us as, as such. It was my sin and yours that put Christ on the cross. And in fact, I had no desire for a relationship with Jesus, so he took the initiative. There is no salvation in any other name. There is no forgiveness, no healing outside of Christ. He's the only one. Christ is the divine standard for forgiveness. Then there's nothing easy about forgiveness. It took an act of God to forgive you and me. It requires an act of God working through you and me to forgive others. The only way for forgiveness to take place in anybody's life, it begins with the foundation. And in order for that to take place, in order for God to forgive us, he had to give his only son. It cost him everything for that forgiveness to take place. So we have the very first part of this. We have the divine foundation of forgiveness has taken place is the gospel. Something that you all know so well. And it kind of goes, I know that I got that. But how does that really work out to me forgiving one another? It's the foundation in which God can work through you and me to forgive others. So let's take a look at an act of forgiveness. Turn in your Bibles left, because if you're in Romans, go left to the, to the Gospel of Luke. Once you're in Luke, stop at chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 36. This also is a well-known story. It's a woman that you're familiar with. It's a situation that has happened, it seems like, time and time again. They are at the home of a Pharisee. In chapter 7, verse 36, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. Jesus is at the home of one of the teachers in Israel, someone who knows the Word of God, someone who is supposed to teach people and understand that. While he's in the Pharisee's home, a woman enters the home, and she stands by Jesus' feet. She's weeping and begins to wipe the tears that are dropping on his feet with her hair. Now, let me get back to the scripture in verse 37. It says, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought in an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him and wept. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And she wiped, wiped them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, this seems kind of odd to us, but let me set up the picture a little bit, what took place. In those days, it was, wasn't, it was customary to invite people over. Hospitality was a big deal. Who's coming to my house for dinner? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, okay, a couple. Where we go? Got one. All right, so everybody was inviting others to, over for dinner. The Pharisee invites Jesus over, and Jesus comes. And Jesus, when he comes, he's not coming alone. He's bringing his disciples. That's expected. When you arrive at somebody's house, the expectation out of courtesy is to offer refreshment. To refresh somebody, it was to allow them to clean their hands and their feet. There were pots of water. There was usually a servant that was there to allow that to transpire and take place. If the person was an honored guest, you gave them a chance to smell nice. We would take someone's hat and jacket and hang them up for them. That's sort of what we do. In those days, everybody was walking everywhere. Body odor was sort of a thing. And you're sitting around a, a delicious meal. The last thing you want to do is smell 
Ooh, body odor. So a little bit of perfume can take care of that problem. Especially if you really honored that person, you would give them that opportunity to be refreshed. Inside the Pharisee's house, also when people ate, they reclined. They didn't sit in a chair like you're sitting in right now. They reclined and laid back. So the, their face and their head was leaning on a pillow towards the center of the table. Their legs extended away. So as the woman comes in, she comes into the Pharisee's house. She's a sinner. Scripture tells us she is. In fact, the Pharisee knows who this woman is too. He knows she's a sinner. Let's continue this a little bit. Verse 39. The Pharisee who had invited him saw this and he spoke to himself. He's thinking this in his mind. This man, referring to Jesus, if he were a prophet, uh, he would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. If Jesus really was a prophet of God, he wouldn't let this woman within five feet of her because she's a sinner and she would defile him. So the Pharisee's working out in his mind going, he's a fake. He's a phony. He is not who he is claiming to be and his teaching is faulty. The only problem is Jesus can hear his thoughts. And now he's going to call him out on it, which is awesome. And so, Jesus, Jesus would not be the person you want to have at your party because as you're thinking whatever, he may decide to bring that out in the open. Isn't that nice? So here, here's what we have taking place. The Pharisee's talking to himself, and all of a sudden, Jesus is going to share a parable. In verse 40 through 43, Jesus answers and says to Simon, not to the Pharisee, Simon, I have something to say to you. <laughs> You're thinking this, but now I'm going to talk to Peter, who is Simon. And so Peter says, okay, master, and he said, say it. Teacher, go ahead. There's a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when, they had nothing, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So Simon is sitting there. He's a fisherman. He's thinking, okay, let me see. 500, 50? That's a lot of money. A lot of money. And he goes, okay, this is one of those things that Jesus always tests us on. I got this answer. This is not a Christian Sunday school, so the answer isn't Jesus. You know what that's like. When in doubt, say Jesus. That's probably the answer. So he's thinking, I know the answer. I suppose the one that he gave forgave more. And Jesus says, you are right. You've answered correctly. That's the right answer. If a person owes you $500 and a person owes you $5 and you forgive both people, who is more grateful? Most likely the person who owes you more money. That makes sense. That's the parable. Now Jesus applies his teaching in verse 44. And then Jesus turns to the woman and says to her, he's not talking to the Pharisee, he turns to the woman, do you see this woman? I entered, this, I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with, the, with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, <laughs> but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet from the time that you came in. I mentioned, I forgot to mention, that was customary to kiss, especially a rabbi, on the cheek in greeting. Jesus not honored at all in this Pharisee's house. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she is loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, meaning Jesus spoke to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Nobody can forgive sins. That is something only God can do. 
Jesus says to the woman, Go, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wait a minute. This is the act of forgiveness. Let me ask you a few questions regarding this woman. Whom did this woman wound? We're told she's a sinner. Twice. Definitely she had some wounds herself, but who who does your sins wound when you sin? Another question. What was her demeanor when she went to him? How did she act when she came to God? She humbled herself. Oh God. We do not have her words, but we have her actions. Did restoration take place? Did she receive forgiveness? Let's draw some hope and encouragement from this. We see Christ forgave her. Restoration has taken place. The relationship between her and God is restored. Yeah? I got a feeling when she left, she wasn't crying anymore. Or if the tears were still coming, they are now tears of joy. I told you we're going to come to the practice of forgiveness. Our third point. We have seen the, 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 the divine foundation of forgiveness and the act of forgiveness. Now we come to perhaps the hardest part, and that's the part of obedience. I know this is difficult, and I do not wish to sound cold or insensitive to any of your wounds. We come to a place where forgiveness can actually heal your wounds. I really like what Nancy, Nancy Lee DeMoss has said concerning forgiveness. She says, forgiveness isn't meant to be free and easy. It's hard, it's costly, it's painful, unquote. So I want to give you the path to help you forgive others. You have your notes with you, or you have a piece of paper of notes. Take to the, black, the, the blank side of that, or turn it over, and make three columns. In your first column, you're just going to write the word name on one side. Turn it sideways, so you've got three columns there. You're gonna, you'll see why in a moment. On the first column, I want you to identify the person who has wronged you. Identify the person who has wronged you. You know who these people are. As soon as I said the name, perhaps a name popped up into your head. It might be a mother, it might be a father, it might be a step-parent, sister, brother, fellow employer or employee. It could be a former pastor, a neighbor, or son or a daughter, an ex-mate, a friend. Write down the person that comes into your mind. You're not digging for everyone who has ever you know, cut you off on the side of the road or something like that. These are names that are coming to you immediately. True forgiveness is not about playing mind games by pretending that that person didn't hurt you. Forgiveness is facing reality. And by the way, one of the names on there for you might be God. You might be mad at God. Once you've got that name down there, the second column is, I want you to list all the wrongs done to you. This is your middle column. What have they done? Write down specific things these people have done to you. What? And I understand we're in a group. You may not want to write down everything. Why should we write this stuff down? You might be thinking, why do we want to even write any of this stuff down? We don't want to bring all these things back up, do we? After all, our goal is we want to forget them. Huh. The things that these people did to you was wrong. They hurt you. Don't run away from it. Turn to God. We need to see the wounds for the genuine sins that they are. And there's one person who deals with sin. That's why we need to turn to him. So, you got the person's name, 
And you're writing down the things that they did wrong to you. Now, the third column is going to be the hardest. The third column is, remember how you responded to them. How did you respond to them? You've got the person's name. You've got what they did wrong. How did you respond? Hmm. Are, you, are you talking about then or now? Could be either way. Uh, could be how, because that could continue. Immediately, how did you respond? And it could be how you're responding currently now. Because most likely, if you've forgiven, then the issue's over. If you actually forgave, forgave them, then you wouldn't be putting a name down, period. If the issue is continuing, then you could be having more things that you're responding to them in. Why are we doing this? Well, you want to make sure that your conscience is clear before the person on your list. When I say, how did you respond to them? Have you loved them? Have you prayed for them? Have you blessed them? Have you forgiven them? To be honest, we, may, we would rather resent them. I want you to evaluate how we spoke to that person. Now, your reactions are normal. If you're angry, if you're peeved at them, if you are, you know, I say angry, frustrated, you want them to die in some of the cases. I get that. I say that it's normal. It's just not Christ-like. We can't really forgive until our conscience is cleared towards them. Until we, our conscience is cleared towards that person, we will never be able to forgive them. And it helps us to recognize our sin. So, we go to the person, we ask them their forgiveness. Right now, you must think that I'm completely crazy. And maybe you've turned off your ears to where you don't want to listen anymore. Some of you might be thinking, that Pastor, you want me to go to this person who's wounded me, and you want me to ask their forgiveness. But it's not my fault. I'm the one who's wounded. It's the other person. Regardless, we are responsible for our responses. Not for how they treated us, but for how we responded to them. If we've sinned, we need to ask their forgiveness just as if we started the issue. I'm not saying that we started the issue. I'm saying that how I responded, I'm responsible for my own actions. I'm not responsible for their actions. But in order for me to forgive them, I've got to have a clear conscience. Conscience against them. Say, well, that all sounds good or sounds too difficult, but let me just put God's Word into place here. Jesus was teaching the importance of dealing with our own sin first in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3-5. through five. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother... Let me take the speck out of, your own, uh, out of your eye when there's a plank in your own. You hypocrite. First take out the plank of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I told you this is hard. I told you this is just flat out difficult. There is nothing easy about Christ coming to die on the cross. I remind you when he was in the garden. He is praying. He's asking others to pray with him. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Come on, help me. You get the idea. And he's asking God, if there's another path around this, can we do something different? And the horrible feeling when he's on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, Christ has all the sins placed upon him. And I don't know what it's like where he feels that God has abandoned him for the first time in all of eternity. Sin separates. So now I'm asking you something that's extremely difficult. 
that cannot be done in your own strength. It can only be done if you let God work through you. That third column is, how did I respond to that person? I speak to that person. I go to that person and say, you know what? Here's how I treated you. I was wrong in doing so. Will you forgive me? Now, what about you forgiving them? You've got to choose to forgive the person on your list. If you want to be an obedient child of God, you must forgive them even if you don't feel like it. If you want to be free, if you want to heal this wound, you must choose to forgive. And maybe you're struggling with that right now. Maybe you're struggling with the right words. This would be your prayer. Lord, I want to obey you. I want to choose to forgive. And I'm releasing them of their offense and letting them go. I forgive them. That's your prayer. And you know what? You may be saying the same thing after today. You may be saying it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You may be repeating this for quite a few days until finally you don't need to say the prayer again and again and again. Everybody here can walk out the door today and let this message just pass by. But let me just ask you this. How much would your life be changed if you were healed today? How receptive would the, go- would the gospel be to others by the way that you respond to those who have wronged you? Lord, the message that we brought before uh, this congregation today is It is difficult for us because we are challenged with the truth and those who have wronged us. And you're asking us to do something that just seems so impossible because the pain is so fresh and just seems to overwhelm us. But you're asking us to put our hands in yours. Huh. And there's a hole in there. And to walk by faith. We're tired of reliving the same things over and over again. We're tired of the life of going through the same drama again and again. We ask, Lord, that you would heal us and help us Move towards this pathway. Pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.